And you just have to think that the enemy is so at play in Christ's church. And it just, it takes my breath away when I think about it sometimes. Pope Francis said in December that there is an elegant demon in the church. And I believe he's right. About five years ago, my husband and I, we were celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary. We went on a pilgrimage with Patrick Coffin from Catholic Answers, and I was just excited we were going to go on this vacation. The spiritual part of it really wasn't that much of a factor to me, if at all. I was just excited we were going to be going back to Italy. Both of our families are from Italy, so it was just going to be a really trip of a lifetime experience for me. We went to... Assisi, Siena, Orvieto, and Rome during our time there. We were there for, I want to say, like maybe almost 10 days or somewhere right around there. And we flew in from Newark to Italy. Now we flew into Rome. We started our pilgrimage in Assisi. So we flew into Rome and we took a bus to Assisi. And when we got there, it felt like we were in a movie set. It was just so unbelievably beautiful. It's not a commercialized place like Rome is, and we got just a little bit of a taste of that when we were there when we landed in Rome. Assisi is not like that. It feels like you are stepping back into time. Totally blown away by it. It's exactly what I had imagined Italy would look like in my mind. It felt like that. You know, if you've seen like The Godfather and those scenes when they are, they're in Sicily, but when you see those scenes, that's what it felt like to me, to be in Assisi. And I remember we checked in and we went out to explore this beautiful place where St. Francis of Assisi, where St. Clair was, and just seeing all these beautiful churches and buildings and just the history of our faith. We had no idea what was to come. This video is sponsored by PrayLatin.com. PrayLatin.com offers Latin prayer cards in various formats making it easy to learn and share basic prayers in Latin. Some prayer cards even offer phonetic pronunciation guides to help with correct pronunciation of the sacred language. So we learned we had a tour guide who was amazing, explained so many things that happened, and there's no way in this video that I can explain all the different things that happened, but Assisi just really captured my heart. It was such a beautiful place. And my husband and I we were walking down these little cobbled streets and I remember us looking up at the Realtor app to see, and there's like these little terraces, and absolutely breathtaking. Maybe we'd be expats and we would just live in Italy. We would go back and I, would, I was imagining our ancestors looking down at us thinking, you know, we, we struggled so much to get to America and look at these two trying to get back to Italy. So we had looked it up to see, well, maybe we could just like Airbnb it and stay in Assisi, but it just captured our heart. And I remember going to see where St. Francis was and we saw where St. Clair was. And the part about St. Clair really just broke my heart. Learning about her story, she was a cloistered nun. And at that time, our daughter was very much discerning a call to religious life. And that was something that she had talked about for many years and she still talks about it to this day. She's in college and just hearing her story that she was a cloistered nun and you get to see the great where she was, you know, behind it and because she was cloistered and wasn't able to have interactions with anyone other than her, than the nuns that she was with, and then the priests that would minister to them and bring them the sacraments. And it just broke my heart. It broke my mother's heart thinking about my own child. And if she went down that path of being a, a nun, and if she ever decided to be a cloistered nun, and I just felt so conflicted in that, you know, the beauty of this place of Assisi and then the heartbreak of Assisi. And I was thinking about St. Clair's mom and how hard that must have been to give up your child. And I think, of course, of Our Lady and giving up, ultimately giving up her son, you know, and just the, the contrast between the two of we're always in that battle in the church, you know, beauty and darkness and evil and just that was just rattling around in my mind. And again, I wasn't going into this pilgrimage thinking it was going to be a religious experience for me. I was just going to Italy to enjoy all the things of Italy and the religious part of it was just kind of a distant, it was just a bonus to me at that time. We got to see the clothes that St. Clair made for St. Francis. We got to see where St. Francis was 
hidden away as a child because he was came from a very affluent family and they didn't want him to be in this life and so they they had locked him away in this dungeon looking thing and then you go into the church where saint francis his cross is and you see where you know he was praying then he heard the voice of our lord telling him to build his church and saint francis took the lord's words literally and built a church and you get to see that inside this bigger church that there is now and it's just amazing to me. It's like you're walking through a storybook, but it's our history as Catholics, you know. And I felt like it was not, again, a religious experience for me that I went into it thinking that. So everything that was happening was just a surprise to me. So as we progressed through the tour and having Mass celebrated, my husband did one of the readings. Patrick Coffin asked him to do it at that time. And so we left Assisi and we traveled on to Siena. Now Siena was very beautiful and we got to hear again we had a tour guide explained all the things that was happening in Siena and in Siena we got to see St. Catherine of Siena and at that time I really didn't know all that much of her story and we went into the church where her relics are housed and if you go in there it was very empty you know, and it almost felt like a forgotten place to me. There wasn't a ton of tourists in there at the time. And when we walked up to where they have, and it's just her head and her thumb. And I remember looking at it. And again, I didn't really know her story, but we were talking and my husband and I, and there was, you know, obviously the people from our tour group were there. Our pilgrimage people were there and they had come from all over the country and I think some people outside of America had come and my husband was explaining to me because I had asked him and just a little aside one thing about my husband is he could tell me absolutely anything and I would believe him I'm not gullible with other people but with him I just always assume that whatever he's saying is true so he is the funniest person that I know I don't know if this will offend you or not it was just something that happened it was a funny story and so I will share so my husband was explaining to me because I asked him, I said, well, why do they only have her head and her thumb? That's kind of odd to me. Like, where's the rest of her body? Because when you see St. Clair, it's her full body. And usually you see saints, usually you'll see their entire body. Well, he said that at the time of St. of Saint Catherine, she would travel from perhaps maybe Rome to, to um, Siena. And she would go along the, the roadways or what have you. And so she would hitchhike. He's telling me this story. And I'm listening to him just so intently because he can tell the story straight face like he's a history book, like he's our tour guide. And he's telling me the story of how she would travel. And so there was this controversy between Siena and Rome for if that was the other place that he told me. And so they argued over her body parts. And so that's why she was one was here and one was here. So it was just a story he's telling me and so when we had gone to lunch with all the other pilgrims I am starting to tell the story of St. Catherine of what had happened to her and I somehow in my mind when I retold this story it was that it had come from father and my husband he's like trying to get my attention to tell me I was just joking I was just joking so anyway a little a little bit of humor in our experience I didn't realize what was coming down the road when we got to Rome we were in Siena, and that was one of our first times that we were experiencing a Eucharistic miracle. And then we saw two Eucharistic miracles in our time in Italy. One was in Siena, one was in Orvieto. And again, because I wasn't going into this with any expectations of any type of a religious experience, and which it's weird to say that now, looking back at that time, thinking, you know, I wish I was there now in the mind I am, or the, in the place I am in my faith now, I wish I was there. But it is what it is, and that's when we got to go. So when we saw these Eucharistic miracles, they completely blew me away. Like when we saw, there was one Eucharistic miracle where they had a priest who was at the time traveling to, he wanted to be laicized. He didn't believe he was going to Rome to speak with the Holy Father because because he wanted to be laicized, and he was with a group of pilgrims. And because of that, he was celebrating the Mass. And he was celebrating the Mass, and he went and he confected the Eucharist. And during that time when he held up the host, it began to bleed. And on the corporal that was underneath him on the altar, it caught the Our Lord's blood on the corporal. That's what they have in this church. 
and it's only revealed certain times during the year and we just so happen to be so blessed to be there at the time when they were going to expose the corporal with our lord's blood on the corporal i had no expectations i didn't know how i wasn't thinking anything other than we were in this place this is what was going to happen they exposed the corporal and I could feel like I, it took my breath away when I saw it. And I was crying. It was ugly crying. It was a whole thing. We got to go up and we saw the corporal with our Lord's blood. And it was such a profound feeling that I had. Cannot explain it other than that. It just took my breath away. We then traveled from Siena to Orvieto. And Orvieto was just this bustling place, lots of people, and the streets are like this big, their cars are this big, and they don't care if there's pedestrians or what have you. I still did not know what was gonna happen in Rome, how much more insane Rome is with the drivers and the people, and you just go, and absolutely nothing could have prepared me. We're in Orvieto, and if you go on a pilgrimage, a lot of times they'll tell you that you are on your own for certain meals. So like maybe lunch, you're on your own where you're able to kind of explore things. But other than that, you're pretty much, you know, whatever the, the pilgrimage is doing or if you're listening to a tour guide or what have you. So my husband and I were on our own at this time and we were walking the streets of Orvieto and I remember taking a turn and I'm gonna insert a photo of the front of this church, which will not do it justice at all. And if you're so blessed to be able to see it in person, I would, if you have seen it, I would love to hear in the comments down below what your experience was. But I remember taking that turn and seeing it. And I remember just, it took my breath away. Again, just similar to like what happened when I saw the corporal with our Lord's blood on it. And it was so, like almost too much beauty for my mind to comprehend at that time. I just couldn't believe such a thing existed in the world. I get, you can see it in a photo, you can see it in a book. You can even see it on a YouTube video, but I think until you can see it with your own eyes in that moment, you cannot fully appreciate it. So I was really taken aback with that, the, the enormity of this building. It just felt like it went up to the heavens. And on the outside of this building, it had different scenes from the Bible on the front of this building. And I think that it's so interesting, not to get too far off topic, but so often we'll hear from Protestants who will accuse Catholics of you know, not allowing our people to read sacred scripture or chaining Bibles. And while that was true in a lot of cases, I think that the rest of the story gets lost or missed or maybe purposely not told. But, you know, these were very precious books that were handwritten, you know, and so they were treasures of the church. And it wasn't because they were trying to keep them out of the hands of the people. They just didn't want them to walk off and be stolen. And a lot of these people were illiterate you know they couldn't read sacred scripture anyway so our church and our goodness would have these images for the people to be able to see and have a visual representation of our lord and what was happening in the bible where they weren't able to read it they could just see on the outsides of these churches and it just so deeply affected me at that time and again i was not going into this thinking this was going to be this profound religious experience for me i was just almost going i felt like a like a tourist you know just taking all of this in and in this beautiful place with my husband and having this great vacation so when i would get these little religious moments or moments of my faith where i just felt like a spark of something was happening it just surprised me because I wasn't looking for it. You know, I think if you go into it expecting to have this deeply religious experience, maybe it's different. But for me, I was just going to Italy to go to Italy. So when we had gone to Orvieto, that was a very quick trip. That was in between going from Siena. We stopped in Orvieto. We didn't even stay overnight. We were just there for the day and then we were gonna travel on to Rome. I remember just being excited that, but I was kind of sad, our trip was coming to an end, but we were going to Rome. Now I had no expectations of Rome. I knew we were gonna see a lot of things. We we're gonna see the Colosseum, we we're gonna see the Trevi Fountain, the Vatican Museum, we'd see St. Peter's, but I wasn't excited or, you know, that wasn't like the pinnacle of our pilgrimage for me to get to the Vatican. It was almost just an inconsequential thing for me, but that wasn't the case for my husband. This was a big deal for him. And I don't know at the time I didn't know at the time just how much it meant to him. 
But anyway, so we took the bus from Orvieto and traveled to Rome and we were on the bus and it felt like when I look back now, I'm not exactly sure on the time and I'll insert it here for you, but it felt like we were on the bus for like an hour, hours, hour, hour, something like that. Well, if you remember, my husband has neck, he had neck problems and he had surgery in August. So we're six months past his surgery. This is the trip that this all really kind of took off for him with his injury. And I'll share more about that in just a moment. So we were traveling to Rome and by the time we got there, it was later in the day. And it was kind of one of those things where you're just, you're, everybody's on your own, do what you want to do. We'll meet in the morning. And that was what the plan was. So when we checked into the hotel, we got up into our room and we were getting everything situated. And I was so excited. I was thinking we're going to go have dinner in Rome and we're going to walk the streets and have this romantic time or what have you. And so my husband had said, well, I want to get over to the Vatican. And I was like, why? You don't even like Pope Francis. You know, like I was, it was like so weird to me that he, that was his focus. He'd had to get to the Vatican. And for me, it was like, okay, it was just one stop of something that we were going to get to do. Let's just go out to dinner or whatever. And when I look back now, I just feel like such a jerk about it. And I, I hate so much. I hate that story so much. Well, that I didn't realize at the time was the beginning of this darkness that had happened in Rome. And we hadn't really talked about it up until probably maybe six months, a year ago. So my husband was really hurt by me not wanting to get over to Rome. And it was a big deal to him. And so by the time we got over there, you know, everything was pretty much closed. It's you, we weren't able to get inside the Vatican anyway. And, I, and that was also, you know, maybe part of the thinking, like it's closed anyway, we're going to see it tomorrow. We have to be there at zero dark 30. You know, we're going to see all this stuff tomorrow. And again, I was in that mode of just, we're kind of just tourists. We're just here because it just meant so little to me to be in the Vatican. I cared more about Assisi, Orvieto, Siena than the Vatican. So when we got there, you know, there's all these barricades. When you get to St. Peter's Square, you can see the Swiss Guard is there. Tons of tourists that are just all over, priests walking around or what have you. And we had taken some photos. And I just, I hate looking back on those photos now because you can just see it in my husband's face. It's just like this darkness, this pall that had been cast over our pilgrimage. And I don't think I really understood the weight of it at the time. So that was just the beginning. After we got back to the room and we had gotten into this horrible, terrible fight, and it isn't appropriate for me to share that part of the story, other than it was one of the worst fights that we had ever been in, in the course of our 25 years now marriage, to the point where I had left the room and I was looking for flights to get back home. Like it, I just, it was a horrible experience. I didn't realize that it would get worse. My husband's neck had started to get really bad and he was in a lot of pain to the point, and then he was also sick. So one of the women on our pilgrimage, when we were down in the lobby and we were getting ready to go, put her hands on my husband and prayed over him and did some kind of thing over him. And at the time, we did not know that this was an issue. And I've shared in previous videos about that, about spiritual warfare and stepping outside your authority and placing your hands on someone and praying over them. And it's, it's dangerous and it shouldn't be done. Now, whether this was what set everything in motion and got things really revved up, I don't know. But it just felt so dark, so cold in Rome that I wanted to get away. I wanted to get out of this place. So my husband and I, we had gone to confession during our time in Rome because of after this terrible fight that we had. But it's still, things were just off. When we got to the Vatican, it just felt cold and dark and just off. And I remember looking back, I didn't know at the time, years after that, I heard a talk by Father Ribiger where he talked about spiritual warfare in marriage. And I'm going to link that for you down below. And he talks about how perception and how the enemy can use something good, like going to a pilgrimage in Italy and kind of use that against their spouse. So like you can have a perception of like your behavior or things that you're saying, but your husband hears that or your wife hears that in a way that is different. And it kind of just implodes 
the whole situation. And I can't do it justice like Father Ripperger does. And I will share it for you down below. And I encourage you to listen to his series on marriage, on spiritual warfare, particularly in marriage and how something as innocent as this, as something very innocent can get just totally distorted and the enemy can, he's always looking for cracks to get into and just kind of blow everything up. A few weeks ago, I was, I've never talked about any of this stuff that had happened during our time in Italy five years ago, but I was just scrolling YouTube and in my suggested videos was a video from Glenn Beck. Now we listened to Glenn Beck long time ago when he was on Fox News and we liked him a little bit at the time, you know, I mean, he was, he's a very smart man or what have you, whatever his religious beliefs, I know he's Mormon, I think he was Catholic, whatever he shares in this video. And I'm going to link it for you down below. Go ahead and watch it for yourselves. But just a little quick synopsis of what he says is that he was in Italy at the time with his wife as a journalist and he met this man. And I'm sure that it has happened to you too. You meet certain people and they just exude holiness or goodness and you can just feel that on them. Well, the truth, you know, it's the same with other people. You know, they just feel like a coldness or darkness or something about them. So they're in this very big room. I think he said it's like this, like a football stadium size. All these different cardinals and bishops and all these, you know, men with, with red hats on. And he was, he met this holy man. And he's explaining to him, you know, who this person is and that person and what have you. And they're just having this wonderful conversation. Well, this other man walks in and he says, this other I think cardinal or bishop, I'm not sure. And he said it was like the room went cold. And you could feel just as much as you could feel that this man was a holy man. This man that walked in was just a darkness about him. And his, he, the man that he was talking to that he felt was like a holy man, he said, do you want to meet him? And Glenn Beck and his wife were like, no, we don't want to meet this guy. We want to get out of here. But he's like, no, you really need to meet him. And he never revealed in this interview or when he was talking about it, who this was. I'm sure we could speculate as to who it was. But anyhow, he meets this man and he said he just wanted to get away from him. And that's how I felt in Rome. So when I heard that story from Glenn Beck, it just brought all these feelings back up for me. And I just felt like, yeah, I agree with Pope Francis. There is evil in the church. You know, there is Christ's church is the spotless bride of Christ and the men can't get to that. You know, popes, laity, bishops, what have you, they can't, they cannot corrupt the bride of Christ. They sure try. And I just remember hearing, okay, so Glenn Beck talks about this elegant demon that Pope Francis says is there. And then I was thinking about what happened to Glenn Beck, this cold evilness that had happened. And then this woman laying hands on my husband and then the evil that happened in Rome and just the darkness that is there. And it just made me think to where we are now in 2023 and how much evil and darkness is in the church. And now that, you know, you kind of feel like the scales have fallen from your eyes and you're seeing the church through different eyes, the men in the church with different eyes. And it's very easy to get overwhelmed with what is happening in Christ's church. When we are looking at men, when we are looking at sinful men, whether it's Pope Francis, whether it's Dina from A Catholic Wife, whether it's your priest, whoever it is, all sinners, you know, the church is built on St. Peter. He has the keys, absolutely. Pope Francis is the vicar. And that's all great, fine, and well. But he is temporarily in the seat of St. Peter. And even though, in it, and this is the part that I think boggles the mind, you know, and you have situations in the church like what's happening in Germany. You have what's happening with Cardinal Zen. And you have men like James Martin. And then, you know, all these little issues that are happening. Cardinal Pell, you know, all these things that we hear about that are happening now. Pope Francis's, I'm sorry, Pope Benedict's book that's going to be coming out that he couldn't release while he was still alive. And the more you hear about these things and you see, and then this targeted effort of the Holy Father against Catholics who are trying so desperately to hold to the traditions of the church. And I think for me, it's just, it means so much because my faith I took for granted for so long. And now I have this, this treasure that I feel like, you know, it's been unearthed for me and I can see it and hold it in my hands. And I just, it's so precious to me, the faith that we have and that we've built and put so much effort into. And then you have the Holy Father who was saying, you know, 
traditional Catholics, we are the problems. Yet what's happening in Germany, he's just, you know, not coming down on them anywhere close to what he's trying to do to people who simply want to love, know, and serve the Lord and worship him in the mass of the saints. And it just blows your mind. And you just have to think that the enemy is so at play in Christ's church. And it just, it takes my breath away when I think about it sometimes. So even though we are in this time of just chaos in the church and there's so little peace that is found, you know, I think that that's another thing that resonates so deeply with me is that just in our little tiny parish, you know, and I can have that moment in time where all that's happening in the larger part of Christ's church can't get to me. You know, and I know that the Holy Father, there's rumors that he wants to crack down harder on the Latin Mass, you know, that these bishops didn't do what he wanted. And you just have to wonder why he has such anger towards people who simply want to worship the Lord in a holy way that is befitting him. And, you know, it's it just, it boggles the mind. And then we have what's happening in Germany, just they're allowed to just do whatever they want to do. And there's no pushback on that. What's happening with Cardinal Zen, you know, in an interview recently, and it just was so flippant, you know, he'll have to pay a fine or whatever. So for me, in my faith, I just have to keep it really small. My family, my faith, the Lord, and what's happening in the church, the universal church, Pope Francis, Rome, the evil that is just so permeated so much of our faith, I have to keep it away from me and not allow it to disrupt my peace. So staying in a state of grace, frequenting the sacraments, going to mass, and being so thankful that we live in this time where the Lord has allowed us to live in the time of Francis. And for whatever reason, he is the vicar of Christ. For whatever reason, the Lord has allowed us to endure this this papacy and to not take our eyes off of Christ and never forgetting who this church is ultimately built on and it is built on Jesus Christ. Next week, I'm gonna share with you a video of me using my missile alongside what is happening in my church, in my parish. I spoke with my parish priest and he gave me permission to use the video that they record from our parish on Sundays for mass. So you can see almost in real time. Now, our mass is usually 30, 45 minutes or what have you. So I'm not going to do a 45 minute video. So I'll, I'll fast forward through a lot of it. But if you are interested in seeing how I use my missile during mass as father is celebrating the mass, come back to that for that video. And until next time, take care and God bless.